The NBA's first ever in-season tournament puts five teams in six groups. Each group of teams only play one another from November 3rd to 28th. These games, which are called quote-unquote group play, determine who advances to the knockout round. Only the number one ranked team in each group will advance to the knockout round, along with the two squads with the best record who didn't finish number one in their group, the wildcards. With eight teams left over after group play, the knockout rounds will feature winner-go-home games in your typical quarterfinal, semifinal, and championship bracket. It's the format of the Champions League overseas, but this is going to be absolutely insane, as we'll get to see the feel of playoff games right around the holiday season. But given the stakes haven't been raised that high yet by basketball fans across the globe, and rightfully so, change is always tough to adjust to, I thought I'd take the time to predict that my Raptors will win this in-season tournament and therefore take home the NBA Cup. Lest you forget, the Raptors are one of five teams over the last five years to have won an NBA championship. Getting widespread respect, let alone attention in general, is still, however, a rocky road. Because despite being one of the most successful organizations in the NBA over the last decade, the Toronto Raptors have just three internationally televised games for the 23-24 NBA season. That is incredibly disrespectful for a team that's made the playoffs in eight of the last 10 years, and in those trips racked up a total of 46 playoff wins, the sixth most among all 30 squads since 2013. There you are again being so disrespectful, disrespectful. You have no reason to be so disrespectful, disrespectful. Don't be disrespectful, disrespectful. Pascal Siakam and OG Ananobi have a ton of experience making shots under pressure in the playoffs. Siakam averaging 19.8 points per game in the 2019 finals, under 9 points less than Kawhi in that series, and the next year without Kawhi, in 2020 when Toronto got one win from making the conference finals, losing a 7-game down-to-the-wire thriller against Boston, Ananobi making 41.5% of 41 attempted 3-pointers, one of which was a buzzer-beating playoff game winner, plus averaging over a steal and a block throughout the playoffs, were massive contributors to exactly half of those 46 playoff wins since 2013, taking place in 2019 and 2020 alone. The two major keys that OG and Pascal can't forget if the Raptors want to have any success next season are as follows. Number one, they have to know and buy into their roles. Number two, they have to be better playmakers. With their ability to set screens, neither of Toronto's top two options should ever be over-dribbling. Also, Masai signing Dennis Schroeder, Marquise Noel, and drafting Grady Dick, plus considering the archetype of Scotty Barnes is a point forward, there shouldn't be any leeway for Ananobi or Siakam to be turning the ball over or taking ill-advised shots, which they don't practice. Step back one-legged, what kind of shot is that? Have you ever shot that shot? Do you work on that shot? Pascal is this team's best offensive player, and OG is this team's best defender. While I initially said Siakam should be traded when the offseason kicked off, his continued desire to win with this team means the Raptors have a shot at staying in the mix and going as far as he takes them. From a Raptor fan's standpoint, one dangerous factor for opponents, which I think a lot of people are forgetting, is the depth of this team. After acquiring Jakob Pertl at last year's deadline, the Raptors went 15-11, tied with the eventual Eastern Conference winning Miami Heat for the fourth best record in the NBA over the final 26 games of the season. For the Austrian on an individual note, after getting traded to the Raptors on February the 9th, Pirtle was tied with Bam Adebayo for the most steals among centers over that span. One of the fastest centers in the association remains as valuable of a role player as anyone Toronto has. Pirtle's leadership presence should have an even bigger impact in 23-24, with the loss of such a prevalent locker room voice in Fred Van Vliet. More on the loss of Fred later on. People have already made the mistake once of thinking Otto Porter Jr. is washed up. Otto proceeded to be a catalyst in the Dubs' 2022 championship run. Now, after being limited to eight games in 2022-23 with the Raptors, forced to undergo season-ending left foot surgery, many are starting to write up the narrative once again that Otto Porter Jr.'s best days are behind him. 
the 6 foot 8 200 pound former Washington Wizard and Golden State Warrior made over 40% of his 47 total three pointers attempted in the 2022 playoffs. I'm looking forward to what we're all going to see from Otto this year. Another forgotten piece to the puzzle is the roster's one Canadian player, Chris Boucher. The Raptors fan favorite needs to be what Bobby Portis is to the Bucks. If not, the vibes, consistency, and therefore winning, winning by winning, and you understand winning can't take place. Luckily, I see a big year from this two-time champ. The Slim Duck needs to have a big season because the Raptors have been waiting for him to break out for way too long now. Boucher's mobile build, three-point shooting, and athleticism is a perfect fit for the modern NBA. I've always said that. But it's just about Chris getting it together mentally over the course of a large portion of games. If he can keep his mind right on and off the court, there's no question in my mind he'll come through in a major way. With Chris, it's just about him committing to it, committing to that development. It'll be interesting to see if he can finally get over the hump this year. Grady Dick showing out at the Rico Hines summer runs is further proof to me that he's about to have a monster rookie year. Maybe Larry Bird's abandoned son was a bit of a strong initial comparison, but I still expect the product of Kansas to have a culture-changing impact. Then, in terms of the major key for 2022 ROI Scotty Barnes in 2024, I think it's similar to the top options on this team in Pascal and OG just knowing his role. At the same time, the Raptors don't need Barnes to average 20 points or anything close to it. They need him to play versatile, set up his teammates, make smart decisions like a third-year player is supposed to, and also be the elite rangy defender that he is. Scotty has a chance to be the best member of the supporting cast around Siakam. If he can embrace the Giannis Adetokounmpo slashing archetype that he's been blessed with and not settle for too many shots beyond the paint, the Raptors could be looking at the Florida State freak. Whether it's that Giannis-esque production or role-player-esque production, when it comes to the upside for Barnes, Toronto will take anything they can get. Remember, Masai made Scotty untouchable in a potential trade for Kevin Durant last year. What if I told you there's a player equally as intriguing as anyone who's been mentioned yet today that we haven't talked about? The potential for Precious Achua is equal to, if not greater than, anyone on this roster. Best way to describe Achua aside from his first name is a three-point marksman in the body of a Bam at a Bio-esque locomotive. Just like Boucher, the mental side of things is the question. With the best player development assistant coach in the NBA back in the fold, prepared for his second tenure with Toronto after a short run with Golden State, Jama Malalela needs to help guys like Boucher and Achua reach their full potential. For Chris, he's got to figure it out more or less on his own given he's a near 31-year-old full-fledged veteran at this point. It's Precious who needs significantly more guidance in terms of what type of player he wants to develop into and how he's going to be able to build up the habits to achieve that. I'm not sure if work ethic is the issue for Achua, but he just needs to establish that he's a really good three-point shooter, stick to shooting a lot of threes, master the offensive playbook, and defend. If he can do those three things, I see Achua having a big year. You can't forget about a man who I dubbed the steal of the 2022 NBA draft in a take I'll admit that hasn't aged well quite yet. Nevertheless, Christian Coloco has endless rim protecting and roll man upside. The Raptors need him to take a step forward as a sophomore, and having two new voices to guide him amidst the coaching staff in Darko and Jamma should be beneficial to Toronto's raw yet intriguing 7-footer. Yet another seemingly failed draft steal prediction of mine was Malachi Flynn. Year after year, us Raptor fans think we're going to get the 2021 preseason version of Malachi where he went off against Charlotte in a few outings. We've never seen Flynn quite the same since those performances. Evidently, that first impression mattered though, given he's still on the roster despite not playing even close to his best over his first three NBA seasons. Year 4 Malachi may benefit the most from the coaching change, however, from Nurse to Darko, given he was buried in the rotation and never got a fair shake as Toronto's backup point guard. Expect Malachi to battle it out with newcomer Marquise Noel for minutes behind Dennis Schroeder all season long. In addition to those factors, here's a few other main reasons for why the Raptors will win the 2023 Cup, and these are my biggest points of the video. The Raptors' culture off the court is going to be completely different than it's been over the last few years. Fred Van Vliet is no longer a mentor or leader of this team, despite sharpshooter Gary Trent Jr. still chilling under his wing in the 2023 summer. Oh no! God! No! God! 
please no 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 don't get me wrong, over the last four seasons, the Raptors were blessed to have FEV lead the charge as the tough, bring your lunchbox to work and put your head down type of grinded out, defensive minded leader. This can have its benefits, like it can really get the best out of young developing teammates who need to be guided through everything. Once your guys are developed though, as Siakam and Ananobi are, with Barnes being a top passer and rebounder at his position since entering the league. At this point, it becomes tough to have fun and develop a winning culture with Van Vliet's source of old school mentorship leading the charge. On a separate note with Fred, it got to a point where he wasn't cracking 40% on his field goal attempts, yet taking over 16 shot attempts every night. That became difficult to place atop the conference with. Fred's 19 plus points per game were beneficial and flashy, but his constant, essentially non-stop over dribbling combined with he and Nick Nurse's unfitting way of motivating those around them, made it ideal for the Raptors to make a change. Dennis Schroeder knows what it's like to play next to a top 15 player in the NBA, like Pascal Siakam. He actually played with two of them in LeBron and AD on the way to a conference finals appearance last spring. Dennis knows he has to set up Siakam at all costs. Dennis knows he isn't the main guy, that he's not the number one option. Again, don't get it twisted, Fred can be the number one option for the Rockets and have a ton of success in his own right. It wasn't going to result in another championship next to Siakam. Siakam needs to be that primary top dog in all facets. Siakam needs guys like Gary Trent Jr. to fall under his wing and buy into being spot up shooters that trust and continuously instill confidence in him. Siakam needs the guys around him to fully trust that he's the number one. Likewise though, Siakam also needs to trust his teammates and be a smarter number one option, but I want to know your opinion on who's going to win the 2023 NBA Cup. This was your boy D-Flow, and I'll see you next video.